Okay, so I just kind of wanted to give us a little bit of context. Most of us probably know this, but since as part of the Institute of Jewish Experience from the American Sephardi Federation, it was very important to me to make sure that we're all on the same page. Most of you probably know most of this. Hopefully there will be one new point that we can get across, and I could also show you a little bit of what kind of things we do. So um, I wanted to start with where we start from. So if you're starting with the Jewish people, you're starting from coming out of Egypt, or you can say first going down to Egypt. We're going to start with getting to Canaan, Canaan. And this is where the conquerors, and you can see where the 12 tribes, the kingdoms were there, very, very short-lived as one country, probably less than 100 years. And at that point, uh, sorry, not at that point, a few hundred years, late, uh, a few hundred years later, the northern kingdoms, right, divided into north and south, the northern kingdoms then became the 10 lost tribes. Again, just talking about basics here. So, even though, whoops, yeah, uh, just so you know, all of these maps, and it helps me to see it in maps, I hope it helps you as well, are from Martin Gilbert's Atlas of the Jewish, of Jewish History, which I recommend to everybody in any of its versions. Um, it's very helpful, some things have been adjusted since then, but that's okay, we, it, it's a good basis. We're starting with the basics. Um, so I do wanna point out that even at 722 or maybe even before that, there were Jews, that, uh, Israelites rather, that had left. So we already possibly have Jewish communities in India, possibly in Ethiopia, definitely in Egypt, uh, definitely in Yemen. Um, this is, these are communities that say they're from the first temple period. So they're ones that have gone during the time of King Solomon, some of them. Um, and each of them went in, into their different communities, some with uh, Levites, some without. And one interesting thing, well, well, I'm gonna jump ahead because I just think it's interesting, is when they went to the when they were taken to Rome by the Roman Empire, the Levites weren't taken with them. And so if you look at the Roman community, today I just happen to have a son-in-law from the Roman community, and uh, the Italkim they're called, is they don't have um, priests, they don't have uh, Kohanim as part of their tradition. And so it's very interesting, you know, in Jerba you have a whole city of Kohanim, and in Rome you didn't have any. So there are all kinds of different tr traditions of when they say the Birkat Kohanim or the um, priestly blessing um, because they didn't have the Kohanim to say it. But that's skipping ahead a little bit because now um, we're talking about Svaradim, right? We're talking about different communities that left. I mentioned they went to Ethiopia, they went to Yemen, they went to India, and eventually to different places as well. The word Sfarad, I think, was very interesting that it, chances are it didn't have to do with the Iberian Peninsula when it started. In the book of Avadia, it says um, the exiles of Jerusalem are in Sfarad, but Sfarad, uh, at that point, they had gone east. So the, the point that they had gone east, chances are it was in Asia Minor, was the original Sfarad. So why do we call the Iberian Peninsula Sfarad? Why are we talking about Sfaradim today? Because Sfarad was considered the elite. Um, it's a nobility. It's a concept of adherence to law and tradition, and that's who the Sephardim from the Iberian Peninsula wanted to be, and that's how they got the term and the name. Um, and so they really began to flourish after 711. Kind of a fun year anyway. Um, and then, sorry, they, did I skip one? Okay, so there's a, here's the map, you can see how widespread the Jewish communities were across the Iberian Peninsula in 1000 until they were slowly expelled or converted, which we know about. I'm not gonna dwell too much on the Inquisition because I think that's what a lot of people know about here, but I wanted to show the strength and the beauty that was the community at that point. Look how full it is. They were doctors, lawyers, carpenters, tailors, butchers, navigators, ship owners, merchants, and of course, many lenders, um, which often got us into trouble, which is probably part of the reason for the expulsion, but 
again, not focusing on that now. Um, one of the people that really thrived in, um, in Muslim Spain, we're gonna see his video now. We have, as part of the ASF Institute of Jewish Experience, we have little video clips, three to five minutes. And I wanted to give you a taste of one of them because I thought it would be fun to, it, it's kind of a cute, fun way to do it, but you'll get, understand how rich the community was at that point. Look at the Alhambra. Does it not look like it's fit for a king? So it is no surprise that it is associated with Ibn Agrila, vizier of Granada in the 11th century, or in Jewish terms, Shmuel Hanagid. Yep, in Muslim Spain in the 11th century, a Jew made it to a ruling status, something previously unheard of in Muslim countries. He is also the only Jew for whom there are chapters of Muslim history dedicated. There's even a famous expression by an Arab poet that reflects his prominence. To kiss the hand of Ibn Agrila is more powerful than kissing the Kaaba. Quite a marker of honor for a Jew in this context. But how did he get there? Well, briefly, Shmuel was born in Cordoba, where there was a multicultural scene of Muslims, Jews, and Christians. But he saw the sacking of the city and the rise of anti-Semitism and decided to get out of there. So in 1013, he fled to the kingdom of Granada, where he sold spices. He was noticed by the local vizier for his linguistic and calligraphy skills and was appointed tax collector, slowly moving his way up the chain. Right before he passed, the vizier praised Shmuel before Caliph Abus. And voila, he's appointed vizier. Okay, maybe not so voila, but that's the short version. And Shmuel likewise continued with Badis, Habus's son, who took over despite some opposition. Shmuel helped him fight threats from within and outside the kingdom. And if it sounds crazy to you that a Jewish vizier would lead Muslim troops to battle, well, it was just as crazy a thought back then. And when word got out of his influence, other Jewish communities gave him the title of Nagid, meaning prince, ruler, basically a high political position. But he had influence beyond the political Muslim world. Shmuel Hanagid wrote commentary on the Talmud, as well as sponsored Rabbi Nisim Ben Yaakov's travels and teachings in Spain along with other notable scholars. His daughter even married the son of Rabbi Nisim. But he was also an influential author of Hebrew poetry. He wrote songs of love and war, of praise and friendship, of wine and lust, of contemplation, and so much more. As reflected in his use of Hebrew to describe secular pleasures, he was not afraid to mix the holy world of Judaism with the outside world. His sons joined the cause from an early age, compiling his songs when they were just six and seven years old. Further following in his father's footsteps, one of his sons even took over as vizier of Granada after him. But he was not quite as popular or successful as Ibn Agrila. And so, Shmuel Hanagid remained singular in his influence through all his endeavors touching upon the lives of many. So that's an example of the kind of videos that we talk about in terms of, of the history and culture across the, um, the Jewish world. That's why we're called the Jewish experience. Um, I wanted to note that we talk about the expulsion from Spain, but it's not only the expulsion from Spain. And Jewish communities got in and out of Spain or the Iberian Peninsula throughout the centuries, particularly because of all these different expulsions. And so I think it's important, again, to see where we, we're starting from whether you want to start from you know, Abraham and Isaac or where I started from, the 12 tribes, where they moved out to, where they were kicked out from, and where we are today. So that's my little spiel.